So let's separate the dorsal and the volar interosseous muscles for a moment and let's just focus on the dorsal interosseous muscles. The dorsal interosseous muscles we would assume sit above the axis of the hand and the volar below. However, as we've already outlined, their origins are very dorsal, but the muscle bellies themselves do not stay in the dorsal aspect throughout the length within the metacarpal area. We see this again on the cross section that even though the dorsal interosseous muscles are more dorsal than the volar, they do not lie above the metacarpals, they are literally more between them. The volar interosseous muscles are indeed volar both to the dorsal interosseous muscles as well as the metacarpals. So the term volar and dorsal are to some extent correct, obviously, because in relationship to one another that is indeed the orientation of these muscles. But the dorsal interosseous muscles are not dorsal to the metacarpals. If I were to ask you how many bellies does each dorsal interosseous muscle commonly have, would your answer be one? two or three? The best answer would be two because indeed usually there are two bellies of the dorsal interosseous muscle that insert in different locations. So what would you say are the primary function of the dorsal bellies of the dorsal interosseous muscles? Let's take a look at this and I hope that you do not become confused because keep in mind that currently we are only discussing dorsal interosseous muscles. But now we're going to be talking about the dorsal belly of the dorsal interosseous muscle as well as the volar belly of the dorsal interosseous muscle. We are not at this moment discussing volar interosseous muscles but only the volar bellies of the dorsal interosseous muscles. In looking at the left long or middle finger, when looking at this drawing, we are looking at a dorsal belly and a volar belly of the dorsal interosseous muscles. Now remember the previous drawings we've looked at in this series have been of the left ring finger which has different anatomy. The long or middle finger has dorsal interosseous muscles on both sides and does not commonly have a volar interosseous muscle. Now the dorsal belly is called dorsal I assume because it is indeed above or dorsal to the volar belly. But what creates confusion, I think, is that they literally cross over one another and the volar belly proceeds and inserts at, into the capsule and then ends into an insertion at the base of the proximal phalanx. So the volar belly has a very proximal insertion. The dorsal belly traversing underneath the volar belly tendon becomes part of the dorsal interosseous and inserts into the fibers that are both transverse and oblique. Therefore, the dorsal belly of the dorsal interosseous muscle affects motion throughout the entire length of the finger. The same would be true here on this side, which we've not drawn in the same way. The dorsal belly would influence the dorsal apparatus. This becomes fairly easy to remember. The dorsal belly of the dorsal apparatus inserts into the dorsal apparatus. So if you can remember the three D's, dorsal, 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 you can remember that the dorsal interosseous, which has a dorsal belly, inserts into the dorsal apparatus. That should make it easier for recall. As we know, the dorsal interosseous muscles 
are responsible for abduction or spreading of the fingers. Commonly, there is no insertion of a dorsal apparatus muscle on the little finger. The abductor digiti quinti assumes this function on the little finger. If you look carefully at this, you can see the insertions into bone that are providing abduction. And I am assuming that these other insertions into the dorsal apparatus can assist with that abduction as well. But if the other muscle bellies are assisting with abduction, now these are the dorsal bellies of the dorsal interosseous, they also are simultaneously helping to extend the finger. We can see these insertions here that are pure AV ductors. In my view, this is exactly why abduction of the fingers is more powerful than adduction, because they don't have to share their power with any other joints. They are purely abducting the metacarpal phalangeal joint. The origins of the dorsal interosseous muscles, slightly dorsal, if you look at them carefully, are long and although not very wide, they cover a significant surface area of the metacarpal. When I think about muscles and I think about a very broad origin, in my way of thinking that broad origin is really what allows that muscle to generate a significant amount of force because it has a very stable base from which to pull. This to me is a, a logical explanation of, of in part why the dorsal interosseous muscles can generate significant power. They have very broad origins. The first dorsal interosseous, as we've discussed, is totally unique. It is in its oblique belly significantly larger than any of the interosseous muscles. As with the other fingers, there's one belly that originates on the metacarpal, which is the transverse belly, and the other belly originates on the adjacent metacarpal, in this case the thumb metacarpal, which means that this muscle has a longer distance to traverse. Both of these muscles insert into usually what is a more purely bony insertion into the base of the proximal phalanx, although it is very common for this insertion to have some fibers that extend into the capsule as well as the dorsal apparatus. The origins of the first dorsal interosseous muscle are very similar to the origins of the other dorsal interosseous muscles in that they are significant in their length over the metacarpal. If we look at the left long finger again and we think of the crossover of these two bellies and we think that one of these muscle tendon units extends into the length of the finger, needing, I would assume, more excursion than the muscle belly that just inserts into the metacarpal, excuse me, just distal to the metacarpal phalangeal joint, there would need to be some differential movement between these muscle tendon units. What this means to me is that it would not be uncommon following trauma to the hand for that differential movement to be very difficult. And that is another contributing factor to the limitation of digital motion. We'll talk again about this. So the dorsal belly of the dorsal interosseous muscles crosses under the volar belly and inserts into the dorsal apparatus. The volar belly crosses over the dorsal belly and inserts just distal to the metacarpal phalangeal joint. There is within the finger an area where also the lumbrical and the interosseous muscles being close together
become adherent relatively easy to one another. That is just before they g meet the intermetacarpal ligament. That adherence of those tendon units is called saddle syndrome. This crossover where I believe there can be some adherence that influences digital motion is not saddle syndrome. The saddle syndrome are the tendons that are the tendons of the interosseous muscle and the lumbrical muscle. The volar belly, just to remind us, inserts just distal to the metacarpal phalangeal joint and is, in my opinion, the primary muscle belly that is active during finger abduction, abduction. The dorsal belly during finger abduction, in my opinion, is busy helping to extend the finger and therefore is only assisting in abduction, but is probably not the primary player. The influence into the dorsal apparatus means that the dorsal belly must share its power of abduction with movement of the finger more distally. In other words, interphalangeal joint movement. Looking at this cadaver specimen, we see clearly that the anatomy is more complex than what we reviewed. We see multiple interosseous bellies here, three I can count, and we see multiple tendons here, not just one. We see that these tendons are actually inserting into different portions of the dorsal apparatus. Look at three tendons here arising. As we pull on the tendons, we can see their tension into different parts of the dorsal apparatus the middle one, and here we see the tension directed to the most volar one, which is literally the lateral band. So even though we have looked at and reviewed this anatomical drawing, this is the perfect example. The, the anatomy is somewhat different, but the principle is the same. The interosseous muscles are sharing their power throughout the dorsal apparatus into different fiber units. Now we're still talking about the dorsal interosseous muscles, but let's look specifically at the volar bellies. Do you remember what we said was the primary function of the volar bellies of the dorsal interosseous? We did say that the dorsal bellies of the dorsal interosseous muscles insert into the dorsal apparatus. So that means that the volar bellies, I would assume, do not insert into the dorsal apparatus. And we've talked about their importance in abducting the fingers. Here's a schematic drawing that shows this to us. The volar bellies of the dorsal interosseous muscles. Now remember, there are four dorsal interosseous muscles, and for some reason, three of them usually, not always because it's highly variable, but three of them usually insert into bone, and for some reason, this quirky long finger often has on the owner's side an insertion into the dorsal apparatus. Now remember, we are not talking about the volar interosseous muscles just the volar belly of the dorsal interosseous muscles. We see that that one belly has some influence into the dorsal apparatus and thus the fibers both transverse and oblique. The adductor digiti minimi as we discussed would be the structure on the little finger that assumes the same function as the volar bellies of the dorsal interosseous muscles the pure A, B, or abductors that spread the fingers apart from one another. Because there are no dorsal interosseous muscles that usually insert into the little finger. Now the dorsal bellies 
of the dorsal interosseous muscles we're looking at again. And here again we have four muscles. We have four dorsal interosseous muscles, so we have four dorsal bellies. And again there's a bit of an anomaly. We said that they insert into the dorsal apparatus with the exception on occasion being the first dorsal interosseous. Usually that is primarily a bony insertion, although there may be some contribution to the dorsal apparatus. Obviously the dorsal bellies of the dorsal interosseous muscles have influence over the dorsal apparatus of particularly the long and ring fingers, influencing just in the same way the transverse and oblique fibers as well as the entire apparatus itself. The index finger, as we know, has the largest muscle, which is the first dorsal. There are still dorsal and volar bellies, usually primarily inserting into bone, but sometimes sharing some fibers into the dorsal apparatus. The volar belly is the oblique belly and is significantly larger than the dorsal belly, which is parallel to the first metacarpal. If we look at this cross-section, we see that very clearly, how much larger it is from the others. The structure below it is the adductor, which is, has also significant size and in total is larger than the first dorsal. The adductor is the largest intrinsic muscle in the human hand. The oblique and transverse heads are called this because they are somewhat different from the just the dorsal and volar belly name. However, it is not incorrect to also call them the dorsal and the volar belly, but they are not commonly referred to by those names. They are commonly referred to as oblique and transverse head or belly. In this lateral view, we see where the name transverse and oblique comes from because the oblique fibers do indeed, with abduction of the thumb, lie in, on, in an oblique plane. Now the long finger, as we know, has dorsal interosseous muscles on both sides. Therefore, there is a volar belly on both sides. But as we said, often the volar belly on the, on the ulnar side inserts into the dorsal apparatus. But remember, because this is variable, it could be exactly opposite. The dorsal belly, however, inserts into the dorsal apparatus bilaterally, and that means when we put them together, the dorsal and volar bellies have influence into the dorsal apparatus on one side and the other side there is a more pure abductor. On the ring finger there is both a volar and dorsal belly with one influencing the dorsal apparatus and the other inserting distal to the metacarpal phalangeal joint. There are no dorsal interosseous muscles on the radial aspect because remember these are abductors and therefore since we're away from the midline they must be on the ulnar aspect only. And the abductor digiti minimi serves the function of abduction on the little finger as well as providing influence into the extension of the little finger. We'll talk a little bit more about the little finger and its imbalance as we move along. Mm -hmm.